So what we're talking about here then, this is the AlexNet again, just standing on its side, is if you now take those filters and look at them, right? Because literally every one of these filters is just a, a small, what was it? 25 by 25, um, oh, 11 by 11, yeah. So every one of these filters on the first layer were 11 by 11 uh, pixel, well, weights, right? Um, and so if you just plot those 11 pixels, 11, weight, 11 by 11 weight matrix into the same space that you had before. So if it was an RGB one, you plot it in RGB space. Um, this is what it learned, right? And it didn't tell it to learn edge detectors or, or color focus points or anything like that. After you trained it and tried to optimize for classification on the ImageNet database, which was trying to identify people and boats and dogs and cats and trees, um, it did well at that, and at the end, once after they trained it, they looked at these feature filters and just plotted them as images, and this is what they got, right? Um, so that in itself is kind of amazing, right? Because this is a sense, uh, uh, it's slightly interpretable. So people say that neural networks are black boxes. In CNNs, you can open the black box a little bit, but what you see inside isn't necessarily easy to understand. Um, in this case, it's easy to understand because um, you can see it, right? Um, it seems to be in lines, like those are useful, right? Um, you train them on lots of different um, types of networks on different images, and often when it has this structure, um, those first layers have things like edge detectors um, or shapes. And um, let me see. So a thing that the other, uh, in the other deck I had, if you go back to like image processing, if anybody takes um, Professor Wang's um, image processing class, I'm sure he talks about these Gabor functions. These are kind of um, functions that people have found in the human brain um, in terms of how we detect um, changes in light and patterns, right? Um, so. Uh, they found these beforehand, and so in image processing, people try to use these sometimes as a way to, you know, uh, build up um, an image detector. And now CNNs are doing it for free. They're just learning it. And people spent decades trying to design these, underside them, and then neural networks just learn it. Um, but yeah, they found this parts of the brain where um, people have these kind of response functions. If you look at some neurons, an area where it responds to contrasts in light and dark, and we have a range of them that change, so it's almost like Evolution in, in animals solves the hyperparameter problem that um, Jogo was asking about by just doing everything in parallel, right? Say, well, let's just have a set of the param uh, a range of these weights and we'll see which one works and we'll do them all and do an ensemble. Um, so yeah, this is, on that slide I was saying the same thing that we often learn the same kind of filters um, in um, deep neural networks. Um, so, it's two different directions to go from that. Yeah, maybe I'll do this one. So on the other slide deck, um, they talk a bit more than about like, well, what if you wanted to really visualize them better? Um, I guess you can't see that very well. Yeah, so often, I guess, um, the hierarchy seems important, right? So you get going from a raw image, you're learning these filters, and the first layer often looks like this. But then the second layer, remember, its outputs then are these images, and it's learning filters on these um, and trying to learn patterns from them. So often the second layer are things that are a bit more complex. Um, so they might learn, you know, the picture of an eye or um, an ear or something like that. Sorry, I don't remember which lecture I'm on. Okay. And. Um, they'll find more complex patterns. So once people started seeing this, they tried to seek it out and say like, well, can we um, um, visualize all the other layers in a more complex model? Um, so this approach of um, guided backprop, you're trying to like, how do we, individual neurons um, 
respond to that image. So once you've trained this and it's working well for your problem, like classification, um, you can give the, the network an image like this adorable cat. Um, and now you could um, say, well, when it's seeing this image, what is every, what is one of these neurons doing, right? We could, we could um, generate the filter that it, it produced, right? Um, and look at it and hope that it's somehow um, useful. So um, people were doing that and the, um, they found that the original image um, isn't necessarily that useful, but there's something there, right? It's like, oh, there definitely seems to be a pattern. I don't know if you can see it that well on this, but if you load the slides on your own computer, you could zoom in um, or look up this paper. Um, there's this hazy cloud-like thing in the middle that seems to match where the cat is. And so that neuron seems to be mapping patterns that are roughly shaped like cats. There's even kind of an ear there, right? With this guided back prop um, approach, um, they set the gradient of that layer to zero. Right, okay. So they set off all, all the other... Um, you basically, once you've learned this, then you try to tune the network to kind of maximize the what's the concept or, or the pattern that this neuron's doing and try to basically boost it. So you turn off all the other nodes in that layer and you try to boost just that neuron and then train the network to keep improving um, with backprop. And eventually what they get on that one then is this more focused, cleaned up version of that neuron and it's focusing on the eyes, right? These like sad blue cat eyes with a ghost of a cat behind it. Um, so they can find that that neuron essentially is, is in charge of detecting this pattern, right? It's an eye, a cat eye detector, a sad blue cat eye detector. Um, and so when they do this on lots of different images, people find um, that you can, that there are patterns for particular neurons that are finding either um, parts of a shape, um, right? So here's what I'm saying. These are essentially creepy eyes or noses of animals. Um, these are letters like from that door and letter um, uh, data set. Uh, so the top layer here are from the sixth level of convolution, and um, the bottom ones are from the ten ninth level of convolution. And I guess in this one, they have the corresponding image. So you give it this image, what does it see, right? Um, and so what part is it focusing in on? So it is determined by each image, um, but you can see what a bunch of the different neurons are getting out of... Um, well, this one particular neuron is getting out for each image, and you can compare how they're they're different. Um, now, does that explain why the hierarchy happens? Oh, okay, then a couple ahead that we got one that goes a moment more. So this approach they're doing then, it's not necessarily to make. So you wouldn't do this just to make your network better at doing classification or something. This is for trying to interpret it and understand what's going on, right? Um, so you're um, doing this guided backprop. Um, I don't know what I is. We've got the neurons, the one particular neuron we've picked. So we've picked a particular neuron. And then um, I guess they've got some regularization function that is tuned for natural images. So it's good for balancing out the colors that happen in that particular image. If you're doing with medical images, you'd have to do some other penalty function. Um, but it's just being added, just like the normal regulars we talked about before. It's probably something that um, emphasizes certain colors that show up in natural scenes over other ones um, and contrast between shapes. Um, so what we're doing then is maximizing that function um, and you initialize it with an image that has no structure um, but this must be after they've trained the network entirely, I think. Um, because then you give it a new image and you compute the scores forward and they do this set where they set the gradients to zero. Um, yeah, so they're, they're tuning. You're trying to get a clean gradient for a particular node, for a particular neuron in the network, um, and then maximizing the effect of that one. So every time you do this, you'd get, um, sorry, I did my mouse instead. You'd get um, 
a, a new network that's not very good and it would be probably not as good a classification but you're trying to basically investigate these neurons and see what what they're thinking or looking at right um, and so you get these creepy um, images sorry I'll go full screen now um, where the neurons are um, learning pieces of patterns of um, shapes that might be useful in recognition, right? Um, so sometimes you can see the shape, there's animals, ostrich pictures, there are these weird ghost-like ostriches in here, um, huskies. But this is, um, I think, a very high level um, layer. Um, so, I mean, you can look at whether these are useful or not, but for understanding our, our the actual question is um, how um, they build up hierarchically, right? So the fact that you've got now, if you think about layer five, right? Layer five it, for every, every neuron out here is responding to maybe, you know, the neighboring um, nine outputs of the previous layer, which is responding to the neighboring nine of that and that, right? So all of the response outputs here are dealing with a very large portion of every image, right? So when they see something, they're dealing with a large space, right? They've been seeing something that was downsampled. When we looked at the Babor filters and edge detectors, those were layer one, right? Layer one is usually very simple things like that because it's about the difference between individual pixels. But then when you do downsampling, um, if you think about the neighborhood each of these pixels would look at, it'd be at least, you know, if that was, you know, the original AlexNet had 11 by 11 and they downsampled by three. So all of these, when you get one response, it's looking to at least a 30 by 30 pixel area, right? Or, or maybe larger. Um, and then the next one would be hundreds of pixels and then maybe thousands. And so at the higher layers, they're looking at shapes of things we recognize like animals and um, things like that. And at the second and third layers, they're smaller shapes because that's the number of pixels they're looking at, right? But they're doing that by, by dealing with these downsampled images that come from the pooling um, of the responses on every layer. Um, um, so that was creating a sense. Well, I guess the next one's supposed to be, I see. So, so for a little while there was like, it was popular to um, explore all these things and create creepy images and three-headed dogs and all this kind of stuff. Um, there was just a paper, an article today in the CBC actually about someone who has um, problems, um, someone who went blind um, late in life and that they have, um, apparently a lot of people have this problem, um, who go blind later in life that they see kind of hallucinations of images around them and they're kind of creepy pieces of of things they used to see because their brain is still activating and seeing stuff around them. And I initially immediately thought of this, that it might be a similar effect, even though these are much simpler than the human brain. Um, we have a visual system that is at least somewhat structured like this, they found um, by doing studies. Um, okay, so let me look back then through people's um, questions. Look, there's been discussion on a bunch of these. Um, dropout, dropout's not that old. Um, we think of it as one of, dropout is, remember dropout is where you um, randomly knock out um, some of the uh, weights while you're training in order to increase diversity. It's basically one of these um, options that you can choose to add or not to improve training as a regularizer. Um, you could train like, Turning on dropout would be something that wouldn't change AlexNet as an architecture. So you could train it with dropout or train it without dropout and see which one works better. I'm sure they tried both. Um, we'd have to go back to the paper and see. Um, but dropout's not something that would show up in the architecture diagram, right? Because um, you uh, you do it while you're training. I want to drop out layer. There could be dropout layers now. I don't know. They're always inventing new types of layers. I'm not sure what that would mean though. Um, but they are fairly recent, like recent in that in the last 15 years, <laughs> if that's recent. Um, 
Uh, you could be right if you're saying that they had it in the 90s. Um, so the colors, yeah, it's hard to tell. I mean, you could do this all in black and white and find the same shapes, but color could be important um, for determining um, certain patterns as well, like the things that are detecting dog noses um, that we were seeing before, right? Dog noses are always black, essentially. So the color is actually very relevant there, even though maybe in birds, the shape of birds would not be that related with color in a universal way because there's so many colors of birds. Um, that's just me thinking off the top of my head there. And it's not clear, um, yeah, we have to go and look at the way they drew these, um, whether the color here corresponds to the RGB color. I would think it would have to. So it's gray when the response is equal across all the colors, right? So in this one with the station wagon, station wagon is a type of car. If you haven't heard of that, it's kind of an old type of name of a car. Um, but you can see that there's a shape of a car here in this filter that's essentially gray. And what I think that would mean is that the this neuron that's being looked at has people basically equal response on all the colors. So color is kind of irrelevant for this neuron but it does have a shape of windows and wheels and maybe trees in the background, right? So that's what this neuron is in charge of, determining if there's a station wagon sideways right in front of you, right? Whereas these other ones are seem to be simulating very complicated traffic jams um, where color is important. Um, but then you could have a hundred of these that where the shapes are almost the same, but the colors are different and it would have different weights, right? So. It's visualizing and trying to understand what's going on in a neural network, but it's not really telling us, in a way, I don't think they tell us that much. They tell us that a lot's going on. They tell us there's a complex pattern being learned. It's learning something. We can see that by the results, the fact that it's doing well, but people don't like a black box, right? People don't like something that um, just works and no one will tell you why, and it's got millions of parameters. You say, well, here's the parameter. Here's parameter 4-217. It's a spider monster. Um, and here's a purple spider monster. So maybe you don't want to know what it's learning, but it uh, it's learning something and you can see how these would be useful, right? Because if this response is high, then things with those shapes um, would be more likely to be in the class, right? Um, and maybe there's no level of interpretation that we can do that's better than this because it is multi like complex. Now for fully connected neural networks where you're just building it with fully connected layers and doing classification, people are trying to always do this kind of stuff too, but you can't really do the same thing, right? Because there's no mapping to visual space. They're just numbers. So you can plot them and you can do clusters of which neurons are near each other and when they fire on what concepts. But with images, we have this particular notion of um, seeing something that might relate to reality. And it's really only interpretable because our brain is good at finding patterns in weird images, right? Um, so we're doing a very complex pattern understanding um, task with our own um, deep neural network in our head to interpret these. So is it interpretation? I'm not sure. Yeah, oh yeah, so the, um, I did um, share the um, cat one as well. Um, so you can look that up. Um, I don't know how well it will show up on the screen here, but that's where I'll end. Um, this paper, they kind of, I guess they, this is probably where they originated the idea of investigating a particular neuron. So it's Andrew Ng of Andrew Ng fame. Um, a lot of Google people. So basically when this came out, it was like, oh, no networks have discovered that YouTube is about cats. Um, which is what I always say this paper is about, but then I was reading it a bit more closely um, on the weekend in prep for this. And it's like, that doesn't actually say that. They knew they were looking for cats. So they gave it a cat data set of YouTube images and then trained it. And they were able to basically learn a categorizer for cats. Um, so they didn't discover it undefined, but it is unsupervised. So they're not um, using this for classification or anything. They're trying to find a way to train their network. And they've just got another combination of the things we've been talking about. So input channels, um, maps, they have a pooling size of five, um, and the output's eight. So 
the weird thing about their paper then is that they have this structure with these four layers. Uh, ah, yeah, the LCN is this thing that is actually not like a normal convolutional layer. There's a different layer where the nodes are connected to each other sideways, um, which is not what you would normally do. Um, but they allow that in this particular case, um, I think. And they're not sharing all the weights, so it's very different than a CNN actually. And then they repeat the structure three times, so they're going deep three levels, and they try to get a hierarchy like we saw in the other images. Um, and so when they then pointed at faces, um, this is the thing they were trying to do, they could do a face detector of famous people faces and learn an average face. Um, Benjamin probably showed you the Fisher faces data set from PCA. Um, you kind of use PCA to extract common average faces. Um, a neural network essentially did it this way, where each neuron has its own model, right? So every neuron in that final layer would have a different type of face it's learning to help it categorize all these people. Um, and then you could figure out which people in the data set it's matching more strongly with any particular average face. Um, but then it was kind of more famous for cat. Yeah, and it doesn't show up probably much on the screen um, is they did this with cat images. And um, when they did it, you can roughly see there's like a circle here and ears. And it's like the average tabby cat you could have. Um, but it's the one we showed in slides was kind of a, a broader version of that that was done afterwards. So I don't know if you can see it. Anyways, I will end there. Um, people are saying what you would, uh, what these would look like while you're on recreational drugs. I would have no comment on that. So I would not advise it. <laughs> um, okay, I think we answered all the questions. Um, great. So that's just that intro. Um, that's 1030. So I'm just going to stop there. Um, but we'll continue tomorrow. There's a little bit more with CNN on this and then kind of other ways of doing similar things, but with time. Um, so look over those things um, and think about it and see if you have any questions and we'll, um, we'll talk tomorrow. Thanks a lot.